Okay, welcome to AQA A-Level Physics 2019 Paper 1. Unlike OCR and Edexcel, AQA do not allow me to show the paper on screen, so apologies. 1.1. Two isotopes are iodine-125 and iodine-131. What's the difference? Well, they've got the same number of protons, but iodine-131 has six more neutrons. 1.2, our iodine-131 undergoes beta decay into xenon. So let's write down what's going on. Let's do the whole equation. Of course, we have an anti-electron neutrino as well. Don't care much about that when it comes to what's going on with the xenon. Beta minus is zero mass, effectively, and minus one atomic number. And we know that we have, therefore, a neutron turning into a proton and electron. Number of protons goes up, but because we have a neutron turning into a proton, that means that the nucleon number stays the same. Therefore, your answer is just 131. Iodine 125 decays by electron capture to form a pteridium nucleide. State two differences between the constituents of the iodine nucleus and the pteridium nucleus it decays into. So let's actually write down the equation, shall we? So let's write down the numbers for an electron. Zero mass, effectively, minus one atomic number and do you believe it's TE? Of course, the nucleide number doesn't change, but the number of protons goes down, so therefore we have a proton capturing an electron turning into a neutron. So we can say one fewer proton, and it has one more neutron. Nice, easy start. 1.4, we have this thing called internal conversion. Nucleus in excited state releases excess energy. That energy is transferred to an electron, and then the electron is ejected. So the pteridium nucleus is in an excited state and can undergo internal conversion. Okay, so three differences between internal conversion versus beta minus decay. So we know that with beta decay, I don't know off the top of my head what it's gonna make, but it's gonna release that beta minus particle, just an electron, but it's also going to release an anti-neutrino. So we can say that beta minus decay beta minus and anti-electron neutrino emitted, but with internal conversion, only electron emitted. Of course, beta minus electron, same thing. Next, we know that with beta decay, nucleus changes as we have a neutron turning into a proton and the other stuff as well, don't we? Internal conversion, nucleus doesn't change because the electron is emitted from orbit. Third one, quite a difficult one to get, but we can say that nucleus exists at discrete energy levels, just like an electron. Therefore, emitted electrons will all have the same energy, unlike those from beta minus decay. Not an easy one, that last one to get. All right, we have this windscreen setup. I have light going in there. First things first, we're being asked, how is there no deviation of the ray as it enters the first prism? It's because the ray is perpendicular, or we could say normal, to the surface. Easy. Next, we're being asked, two reasons why there's no deviation as it goes from the prism into the windscreen glass. Well, of course, in order for there to be no refraction, we need no difference in refractive index at all. So first things first, prism and glass have same refractive index. But also we can say that they're touching no air gap between. Doesn't have to be air, of course. It can be anything with a different refractive index, even a vacuum. Okay, we're told the refractive index of the glass is 1.52. Why does it follow the path? In other words, why does it TIR at that point? And we have an angle as well of 45 degrees. This is our N2, this is N1. This, of course, is air, and this is the glass. So. Snell's law, let's crack it out. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. So we're looking for the critical angle. So we're going to say that that's theta C. If we're looking for the critical angle, we're looking at the angle of incidence needed to make it go along the boundary. So sine theta ends up being sine 90. So that disappears. Therefore, rearranging this, we have sine theta C is equal to N2 over N1. So that's equal to 
1 over 1.52 because the refractive index of air is 1. If we inverse sign that, we find that the critical angle is 41 degrees. So we can say as theta 1 is greater than theta c, TIR occurs. 2.4, now we have a droplet on top, so it's no longer air, it is water. And we're given the refractive index of water as 1.33. So why is there less light hitting the detector now? Well, it's because, of course, some of that light is refracting into the water. But let's prove it. N1 sine theta 1. Let's use the same equation. Let's use the same equation that we just made. Sine theta c is equal to N2 divided by N1. That's 1.33 divided by 1.52. And we find that the critical angle is now 61 degrees. So we can say... As theta 1 is now less than theta c, TIR will not occur, therefore light will refract out. Not all of it, because we do have partial reflections still making their way to the detector, don't we? Therefore intensity of light reaching detector reduced. Two point five refractive index can vary by a few percent. So of course, if n varies, path of ray will not be straight. I think it's a bit mean because without doing the calculation, it's a bit difficult to get the second point. But it's only a few percent, therefore will not change the intensity reaching the detector by any meaningful amount. In other words, it's going to be fairly insignificant. Not a very nice question though. Different design has the LED and detector further apart. How will it affect the sensitivity? Well, two points. First point is that we know that more droplets equals more places for light to refract out. Therefore, the sensitivity will increase because basically it's picking up more droplets, isn't it, if they're further apart. That's the easy one. Slightly harder one, basically because surface of glass will have scratches, etc. And there'll be imperfections in the glass as well. If they're further apart, intensity of light when no droplets is reduced. Therefore, that will result in a lower sensitivity because you're reducing the difference between the biggest and lowest intensities. But I don't think that that's a big deal. This one is a bigger factor. Bit of an annoying question, question two. Let's go on to something a bit better. Young's little slit, question three. Describe the pattern produced on the screen. Of course, we know we're gonna have fringes, maxima and minima, resulting from constructive and destructive interference. They're going to be purely green because we have that green filter. And we know all fringes have same width. You should say angular width, but whatever. And we know that they decrease in intensity the further from central max. 3.2, green filter replaced with red filter. What's going to happen? Well, we know that the wavelength of red is longer than the wavelength of green. And the rule of thumb is bigger wavelength, more diffraction. Therefore, fringe spacing will be larger. Second mark, a little bit mean. I mean, we've already sort of answered it, but we're looking for a wider central max as well. But that's part and parcel of W being bigger, but whatever. Okay, next we have a diffraction grating. We have 500 lines per millimeter. Tell you what, let's find out what our grating spacing is first then, shall we? So therefore, we're going to turn into lines per meter. So therefore, we times by a thousand. So that gives us five times 10 to the five lines per meter. But then we want meters per line, as it were. So therefore, we're going to do one over that. In my estimation, I think that should give us two times 10 to the minus six meters. So that's our D. We are looking for theta. We're given the wavelength, that's 650 nanometers or 6.5 times 10 to the minus seven meters. And our equation is n lambda equals d sine theta, of course. n is one because we're looking for the first order. So that means sine theta is equal to lambda divided by d. So that's 6.5 times 10 to the minus seven divided by two times 10 to the minus six. Or uh, tidying up powers of 10, that actually is just 6.5 divided by 20. And it gives us, well, the two sig figs. 19 degrees. Okay, so in practice, filter transmits red light, 600 to 700 nanometers. How does it affect the appearance of the maxima? Well, we can say that orders will be wider, and we can say they get wider as order increases as well. 
I mean, the mask game also says that the central max will be unchanged in width, but whenever it comes to how does the orders from a diffraction grating change, it's always best to find out what order you get at 90 degrees. They always try and put that in there, right? So that's a rule of thumb. Always go for sine 90 and see what happens. Okay, so we're going to go n lambda equals d sine theta. We're going to do this twice for 600 and 700 nanometers. So let's find out what n is for 600 nanometers first. Of course, we're talking about sine 90. So that ends up just being 1. So n is equal to d over lambda. So that's 2.5 times 10 to minus 6 divided by r. 600 nanometers, so 6 times 10 to minus 7. Or in other words, 25 divided by 6. And that gives us 4.2. So in other words, we are going to have the fourth order for 600 nanometers. But if we do the same for... 700 nanometers, we end up with just 3.6. So there is no fourth order. So in other words, the fourth order will not be completely visible as the longer wavelengths will be past 90 degrees. So we can't see it. Okay, we have a catapult. Uh, I think you'll find it's a trebuchet. Counterweight, blah, blah, blah. Just how the pivot position achieves this. Cause it is, cause it is at the center of mass of both combined. So therefore no turny. So I guess we should probably explain that. Therefore, no resultant moment. Okay, next we've been asked to find the tension in the rope. There's the rope there, tension there. Okay, so first things first, let's draw our forces on here. So we have the weight of these stones. So therefore, that's 600 times G. So 600 times 9.8. That's the weight of that. And then over here we have the projectile. The weight of that is 250 newtons. So at the minute it is balanced, but it's not the moments due to the weights that are balanced. No, it's because we have the vertical component of the tension pulling down as well. And that's what we're concerned with. That's how we can find out T. So we can say that this is equal to T sine 50. And it's sine because we're turning away from the 50 degrees. Turn away from your signs. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch my Easy Vectors trick video. So now we can start to make our equation then, can't we? So we can say that 250 times 4 plus T sine 50 times 4. So moment due to the projectile plus the moment due to the vertical component of the tension is equal to 610 times 9.8. And that's times 1.5. That's the moment due to the counterweight. So I think I might tie this up a little bit first. So I'm going to change that to 4 T sine 50. Okay, so therefore, 4t sine 50 is equal to that many newtons. Therefore, all we have to do is take the 4 and the sine 50 over the other side. And it gives me 2,600 newtons. So don't forget that whenever you have forces at an angle in a moment's question, we always want to resolve to find out what the component perpendicular to the distance is. Next, we have some projectile motion. We have the projectile being released at... 18 meters per second. We're being asked to calculate the range. Of course, we need to split it into vertical and horizontal. And the only thing they have in common is the time. So let's do vertical first to find out the time, time of flight. We know that S is 7.5, that's the vertical displacement. U is zero. That's something that people often get wrong. It is not the 18 meters per second because of course, we're talking about vertical velocity. V, we don't care about final velocity. A is 9.8 meters per second squared. I don't need to use minus. So long as you're consistent, it's fine. Really, the only time that you use a negative in SUVAT is if you have something change in direction mid-flight. And we're looking for time. So classically, we're going to use S equals UT plus half AT squared. UT disappears. Therefore, T is equal to the square root of 2S over A. That's the square root of 15 divided by 9.8, and it gives us a time of flight of 1.23 seconds. Then I'm gonna take this over here. Of course, horizontally, there's no acceleration or deceleration, no resistive forces. So we can just use speed equals distance over time. And of course, we're looking for that. So therefore, distance is equal to speed times time. So that's the 18 meters per second times 1.23, and it gives us 22 meters. Okay, 4.4, we've been asked what would happen if it's released just before it's vertical, not released horizontally. So instead, it's going to go like that. Of course, that does mean that there is now vertical components of velocity. Therefore, time of flight will be longer, therefore larger range. 
but that is assuming this is not negated by the smaller horizontal velocity. We could also say that it's been accelerated for less time, therefore EK will be less, and the velocity of course, therefore smaller range. Bit mean because unless we do some calculations, there's no real point just talking about it, it's all just conjecture. 5.1 safety barriers, we have this, absorb kinetic energy, we have the mass is 1,500 kilograms. We have the initial speed is 110 kilometers per hour. Shall we change that into meters per second? I think so. So that is 1.1 times 10 to the five meters per hour, just times in that by a thousand. But then we need to divide that by 3,600 to get meters per second. And it gives us 30.6 meters per second. Okay, so what are we being asked first? Find the kinetic energy. Oh, that's nice. EK is equal to half mv squared. So that is a half times 1,500 times 30.6 squared. And it gives us 7.0 times 10 to the five joules. Okay, next we have the vehicle hits a barrier at an angle of 20 degrees. Calculate the component of the momentum in a direction along the safety barrier. So obviously it has momentum going this way, but we want to know the momentum going in that direction. So if that's 20 degrees there, that's 20 degrees there too. Therefore, the horizontal momentum is going to be mu times cos 20. And it's times because we know it's going to be smaller than the resultant momentum and it's cos because we're turning through that 20 degrees. Again, watch my easy vector trick video if you don't know what I'm talking about. And it gives us 4.3 times 10 to the 4 kilogram meters per second or newton seconds, whichever one you want. Let's go with kilogram meters per second actually. Mark scheme says 4.4, but that's just rounding error. They haven't been super accurate. Okay, so the vehicle moves along the safety barrier with no change in momentum in this direction. Show that the kinetic energy lost is about 80 kilojoules. So we're looking for the difference in energy. So there's going to be beginning kinetic energy take away the end kinetic energy. So in other words, that's going to be half m u squared. So initial kinetic energy, we're using u instead of v, and then take away half mv squared. We can factorize that in a second. Okay, so we need to know what the two velocities are. Of course, we know that it was 30.6 going into the barrier, but then what's the horizontal component of that? Because that's what it's traveling at afterwards. Similarly to the momentum, which you did just now, it's going to be that times cos 20. So let's factorize this. So that's half m times u squared minus v squared. So half m times 30.6 squared, take away 30.6 cos 20 or squared. Turns out that this is 28.8, by the way. And indeed that does give us 80,190 joules, which is to two sig figs, 80 kilojoules. 5.4, barrier deforms. The vehicle should not move more than 1.5 meters towards the other carriageway. Barrier can apply average force of 60 kilonewtons. Okay, so D is equal to 1.5, or is it? F is equal to 60 kilonewtons, so six times 10 to the four newtons. Deduce whether the safety barrier will pass the test. So we're talking about work done, of course. We have a distance, we have a force. We have the kinetic energy that's lost, so that's gonna be equal to our work done. If that kinetic energy can't just disappear, it has to go somewhere. That's going into doing the work against the force of the barrier. And we said that that was eight times 10 to the four joules. Okay, so there's a couple of ways we can do this. The Mark scheme says to do it a really weird way, but of course the easiest way is finding out whether or not the car moves more than 1.5 meters or not. So let's do that. We have our work done equation, E equals FD or W equals FD, whatever takes your fancy. We're looking for the distance. So distance is equal to the work done divided by the four. So that's eight times 10 to the four divided by six times 10 to the four. So in other words, eight divided by six, and it gives us 1.3 meters. So yes, car will not move 1.5 meters. Okay, different barrier uses concrete, does not deform. Same standard test is carried out. Discuss which type of barrier would cause less damage to the dummies in the test. Of course, it's the first barrier is safer. Why? Well, with concrete, no energy is transferred to the barrier. 
if it doesn't deform. Therefore, it is going to be an elastic collision. Therefore, change in momentum is going to be equal to two times the initial momentum because the car is going in and off the concrete wall like that. Therefore, as force is equal to rate of change in momentum over time, force experience will be way greater. And that's when you get damage. So crumple zones and soft things to go into much better, keep you safer, much better to crash into. Give a loudspeaker, SHM. We are being asked to state the time when P is moving at maximum positive velocity. Positive velocity is equal to a positive gradient. Therefore, we're looking at this here. So at this point, so it's 1.5. Easy peasy. Calculate the maximum acceleration. Well, let's crack out our initial equation for SHM. Acceleration is equal to omega squared x. We don't need the minus because we're just talking about magnitude in this case. If we're looking for max acceleration, then we're looking at what the acceleration is at amplitude. So that's omega squared a. Of course, we know that omega is equal to 2 pi f or in other words, 2 pi over the time period. We can say that this is equal to 2 pi over t, all squared times a. So that's going to be equal to 2 pi divided by, let's have a look at the graph. Time period is 2 milliseconds, so that's 2 times 10 to the minus 3. Cancel the 2s, and that is all squared. And the amplitude is 4.2 millimeters, so 4.2 times 10 to the minus 3. So that gives you a very big acceleration of 4.1 times 10 to the 4 meters per second squared. Seems huge, doesn't it? But if you think how fast this loudspeaker cone is vibrating, it makes sense. 6.3 loudspeaker creates variations, blah, blah, blah. What type of wave is produced? Of course, sound waves are longitudinal. Describe the motion of the particles in this type of wave. Of course, you know that they don't go like that, like a transverse wave, even though we do model it like that particles oscillate along or parallel to, you might say direction of wave, but they like you to put it in these terms, parallel to direction of energy transfer. That's a nice easy question. 7.1, bit of electricity. Okay, we have this circuit. Why does the reading on a voltmeter decrease as the brightness of the lamp increases? So if this is just a normal circuit, then V should be constant because that's our terminal PD, isn't it? So if not, there must be internal resistance. So that's what this question is about, even though they haven't actually said that. And we can sort of spot that because in the question at the beginning, it doesn't say that the cell has a negligible internal resistance. So they always have to say that uh, if it's just a normal electricity question, as it were. And so if you don't see that at the beginning of a question, that should tell you that it's actually about internal resistance. Okay, so as brightness of the lamp increases, why does that happen? It's because current is increasing. And we know that as current increases, volts lost due to internal resistance increases. Therefore, the terminal PD, which is what we're measuring, decreases. That's what we're measuring with our voltmeter. Okay, so 7.2, we're now adding another cell in parallel with the first. So why do we end up with V increasing? Well, it's because we can say that it's reduced current through each cell because the EMF is staying the same, total EMF is. Therefore, fewer volts lost due to internal resistance. Therefore, V increases. You could say, again, that's terminal PD. Okay, enough with the wishy-washy. Let's do some multiple choice. Eight, we have beta plus decay. What are particles X and Y? Proton goes in, neutron comes out. So whatever this is, proton's positive, it's taking away positiveness as it were. So therefore that has to be W plus. And then we have beta plus there. And of course this is gonna be a neutrino of some sort, but we know that with beta minus, we have an anti electron neutrino but with this, it's going to be just an electron neutrino because lepton number of a positron is minus one because the electron is the OG lepton. It gets to have the lepton number of one. So therefore the lepton number of this has to be plus one. So it's just a neutrino. So the answer is A. Nine, electron collides with isolated atom. Okay, raising it, which is correct. 
A, the colliding electron is captured by the nucleus. Nope, not that. That's not really a thing. It can happen with electron capture, but not with just raising electrons. B, photon is emitted when the electron raises, rises. No, that's not true. It's only when they de-excite. C, an electron is emitted when the excited electron returns. No. You might have read that as photon. I certainly did to begin with, but it says electron. D, energy is transferred from the colliding electron to the orbiting electron. Of course it is, so it has to be D. 10, lighter frequency that. Oh, I think I'm going to have to go over here, aren't I? So we have lighter frequency that, and we have the work function, and we're being asked about whether they're going to be electrons emitted. Okay, so first things first, let's find out what the threshold frequency is. So work function is equal to HF0, where F0 is the threshold frequency. Therefore, it's going to be equal to 4.6 times 10 to the minus 19 divided by Planck's constant, and that gives us 6.9 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So that's a threshold frequency. This is greater, so we are going to have electrons emitted, so it's not going to be A. And now we just need to find out what the energy actually is. So maybe we should have just done this before, but we're going to do EK is equal to HF minus phi. So that's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times 2 times 10 to the 15 take away our work function and that gives us 8.66 times 10 to the minus 19 joules so the answer is going to be c photon has frequency of that what is the momentum of the photon okay this is to do with de broglie so lambda is equal to h over mv but in this case there's no m it's just momentum that we're looking for. So swapping these two round, and momentum is equal to Planck's constant over the wavelength. Of course, from the wave equation, lambda is equal to V over F. So therefore, popping that in here, we're going to have momentum is equal to H F over V, or C in this case, because it's the speed of light. So 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times the frequency divided by the speed of light. You could tidy up powers of 10, but it can't be bothered. And we end up with 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 27 kilogram meters per second. So the answer is C. Which statement about a couple is not true? A, it must consist of coplanar forces. Yes, that's true, so it's not that. B, it can produce rotational motion. Of course it can, so it's not that. C, it can produce translational motion. No, it cannot. So that's our answer. It can't move an object up, down, left, right. It can only spin an object. Otherwise, it's not a couple. It has the unit Newton meters. Of course it does, because it is ultimately a moment. All right, 13, two cars. What's the distance between them at eight seconds? So we're looking for distance, and that is the area under the graph for both because it's a VT graph. Okay, so the distance for P is going to be, well, I can see we have a triangle there, so it's going from one to three. So it's gonna be two times 20 divided by two. Of course, two's gonna cancel there, plus then the rectangle until eight seconds. So it's gonna be then 20 times, what's that? It's going from three to eight, so, five seconds so therefore that's 20 plus 100 so that's 120 meters what about for q well nice and easy it's just a straight line so it's just going to be 8 times 40 divided by 2 or in other words 4 times 40 is 160 so therefore the difference is going to be 40 meters so the answer is a 14 this kind of question catches a lot of people out so it's all to do so it's all to do with the forces before and then afterwards. Okay, so what are the forces like before? Well, of course we have 0 0.3 times G, not 0 0.3 grams, 0 0.3 kilograms times G pulling downwards. So that must mean that we have in the spring the same pulling upwards. When it's cut, that is still there, but now we no longer have the 0 0.3 G because we're now only concerned with this thing. And of course, it's only pulling down with 0.2 G. So therefore, we have 0.3 G pulling up, 0.2 G pulling down. So therefore, the resultant force afterwards is going to be 0.1 times G. Force is then equal to mass times acceleration. Therefore, acceleration is equal to force divided by acceleration. So in other words, that's 0.1 times G divided by the 0.2 kilograms. So therefore, that is G over 2 
So that's going to be 4.9. And so the answer is B. So it's just a matter of figuring out the resultant forces and then applying that to F equals MA to find the acceleration. 15, lift of mass. Oh, I have a whole video dedicated to this. So have a look at that. It's called tension versus weight, if I'm not mistaken. So it accelerates downwards. So therefore, just think, how much tension would you need to make it levitate? Well, you'd need mg to float or to hold. But because it's accelerating downwards, t is going to be less as it's accelerating downwards. But we have the added complication of a frictional force as well. So let's draw the actual lift. We have the tension is pulling upwards. We have mg pulling downwards. But because it's moving downwards, that means that the frictional force is actually going upwards. So therefore, F is helping, as it were. So therefore, that's reducing the tension even further. So it's going to be mg minus ma minus the frictional force because it's reducing the tension even further. Or in other words, m times g minus a minus F. So that is the answer, D. Body falls, rate of change of momentum is equal to the, well, we know that force is rate of change of momentum, don't we? So it has to be a force. So therefore the only force here is weight. So the answer has to be D. Nice, easy one. 17, electric vehicle, driven by a motor, blah, blah, blah. Which statement describes the variation with time of the power developed by the motor? Right, okay. So it travels from rest. Okay, so, so we need our equation P equals FV. But if this is constant, but it's going from rest, it means the velocity is going up, therefore the power has to go up as well. And it is linearly, so therefore, you know, P is proportional to V, therefore the answer has to be B. 18, mechanical power, what's true? It's a vector quantity. No, that's not true. Power is not a vector. It's measured in joules, no, it's joules per second, of course. It's fundamental unit is that, guaranteed it's going to be that. So have a look at D, force times distance, no, it's not going to be that. It is going to be C by process of elimination. Let's just check it though. Power is equal to, well, I'll tell you what, we can use the equation that we just had, force times velocity, so that's equal to MAV. So therefore the units of that is going to be kilograms, and acceleration is meters per second squared times meters per second. So we end up with, yes, kilograms meter squared, seconds to the minus three. 19, load of 15 newtons suspended. Okay, so we're talking about stress. So stress is equal to force divided by area. But because we're just talking about orders of magnitude, we can just ballpark this. So this might catch you out a little bit. Force we know is 50, but what's the area? Well, we're given one millimeter squared. Now you might be tempted to say that that's equal to one times 10 to the minus three meters squared, but no, that's not the case because of course, it's so millimeter squared, we have to do it twice. So it's one times 10 to the minus six meters squared. Therefore, the stress is going to be that 50 divided by one times 10 to the minus six. So in other words, 50 million. So that gives us five times 10 to the seven Pascal. So the answer is going to be between 10 to the six, 10 to the nine. So the answer is C. 20, which combination of properties will produce the smallest extension? Okay, we're talking young modulus. So let's get our equation out. So E is equal to FL over A delta L. So we have the same force for all of these, don't we? But we're looking for the smallest extension. So we're going to swap around those two. So therefore, delta L is proportional to L over E A sports. So let's do A first. We're talking about a length of three divided by your modulus of one, relatively speaking, times extension of one. So that gives us three. Let's go for B. We have one over two times one, so that's going to be a half, so we're already smaller, so it can't be A. Let's go for C. We have a length of three divided by, it's probably not gonna be the ones with three, is it? Oh, it could be, actually, let's check it out. So two times four, so that gives us three eighths. So yes, it's even smaller, so it's not gonna be B. Let's just check D. We're talking one over two times four. Oh no, this is way smaller, it's one eighth. So the answer is D. Okay, rubber belt has a width of 0 0.1 meters, moves with a speed of 0 0.4 meters per second. I think this is gonna be a units are your friends question. Each meter square carries the charge Q, coulombs. Charge is removed and transferred to another plate. Okay, what's the charge collected by the sphere each second? Ah, I was right, it is gonna be one of these questions. So we're looking for coulombs per second. 
So if we times these together, we end up with 0 0.04 meters squared per second. So we know that each meter squared is Q coulombs, so therefore 0 0.04 coulombs per second. Oh, so therefore, in other words, 0 0.04 Q. It wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. 22, we have a PD of 1.5 volts. Which particle gains three electron volts of Ke when moving from Y to X? So we know that if it's an electron, then it gains, it's in the name EV, so it would be 1.5 electron volts. An electron, or anything that has a charge of E, like an electron that's accelerated through a voltage, is going to have that many electron volts. So therefore it can't be a proton, it can't be a positron, it can't be an electron. So it's going to be D, it's going to be the alpha particle, but why is that? Well, it's because it has double the charge. So double the charge equals double the EK. 23, we have some sort of current, I don't know, what's the potential difference between point P and Earth? Well, we know that Earth is going to be zero volts down the bottom. And we have four amps going in here. We have two amps going in here. So therefore we know we're going to have six amps going through the 20 ohm resistor. Therefore V equals IR. So six times 20. So that's the PD of the bottom resistor, but then we need to add on PD across the 10 ohm resistor. Of course, V equals IR just gives us two times 10. So that gives us 20 volts. So 20 volts plus 120 gives us 140 volts. So the answer is D. All of electricity just comes down to V equals IR, folks. Okay, 24, we have a voltmeter and let's draw a diagram, shall we? Okay, so the voltmeter and resistor in series like that. So that's four kilo ohms, and the EMF is 20 volts. Oh, they made this one needlessly complicated. Okay, so it reads two divisions, one volt. So therefore, it's going to be two volts. That's so dumb. Whatever. Therefore, we know the PD across the resistor is going to be 18 volts. So, of course, we're going to use V equals IR to find the resistance, but first we need the current. So we're going to use that to get the current. I mean, we can just do a whole, you know, V over R equals V over R if we wanted. If we know the current is the same, we can just say V over R equals V over R. So rearranging this, we find R2 is equal to R1 times ratio of the voltages, V2 by V1. So that's four. We can just leave it as kilo ohms because the answer's in kilo ohms. It's just all relative times by 18 divided by two. So in other words, four times nine. So it looks like the answer is going to be 36 kilo ohms. And, and so that means the answer is B. Okay, we have two cylinders, same material. And they're connected in series. What's going to be the same for P and Q? Let's have a look at A first. We know that resistivity is going to be the same, but we know that they're not going to have the same PD because they are different thicknesses. Therefore, they're going to have different resistances. So the PD isn't going to be the same. So we'll look at B, resistivity. Yes. Current. Yes, of course. It's going to be the same because they're in series. So the answer is B. Nice and easy. 26, we have this circuit set up. We have a voltmeter between the two branches. Okay, so the temperature is increased. So for the thermistor, that means that resistance goes down. And so therefore, so does its share of the voltage. Its share has gone down. So therefore, we want R to do something similar. We want its share of the voltage to also go down, so therefore we want the resistance of R to go down as well. So therefore the answer is A. Electric motor lifts a load of weight W, vertical height, height in time T. Okay, what's the efficiency? So we know that efficiency, if we could do energy or power, it doesn't matter. Uh, let's do energy, I think. Or should we do power? Let's do power. So it's useful power out divided by all of the energy going in. The useful power out is going to be the weight being lifted. Now, if we're talking about power, then it's going to be the weight times the speed. And if we're talking about the power in, then we are talking about the voltage times the current. And last but not least, we know that speed is equal to distance over time. In this case, it's height over time. So if you pop that in there, we end up with an efficiency of W times H divided by VIT. So the answer is C.
28, we have a mass, we have a radius, we have a frequency of n. That's a little bit cheeky, isn't it? They've given us n instead of f. What's the kinetic energy? Well, kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared. V is equal to omega r, if we're talking about circular motion. So that's 2 pi fr, or in other words, 2 pi nr in this situation. So then popping that in there, we end up with half m times 2 pi nr all squared. So that is a half times m times 4 pi squared times n squared r squared. And then last but not least, we can just cancel that to make 2 m pi squared n squared r squared. So it looks like the answer is C. So we have displacement time graph for SHM. What's going to happen with the kinetic energy? Well, of course, we know that kinetic energy is greatest at the equilibrium. So right here and right here as well. So again, we know that kinetic energy is a scalar, so it doesn't really have a negative value. So it's not going to be A, it's not going to be B. And like we said, we know it's going to be greatest at the beginning. So therefore, we know that it's going to have this shape here. So the answer is D. Okay, 30, two pendulums. Okay, so this one might catch you out, but at the end of the day, if we're looking for when they're next in phase, we need one oscillation difference at certain time. And so if you have a look, we have 198 seconds and we have, so if we say, you know, 49 oscillations times two seconds gives us 98 seconds. So we can say not a multiple of 1.98, so that doesn't work. So let's go for 99 instead. 99 times 2 gives us 198 seconds. Of course, if we do 100 times 1.98, that gives us 198 seconds as well. And so with 198 seconds, they're going to be in phase. One oscillation difference. Therefore, the answer has to be C. 31, we have frequency for a spring system. You know, the equation for the time period is 2 pi root m over k. So therefore, we can say that t is proportional to root m, but we're not looking for time period, we're looking for frequency. Frequency is reciprocal of time period, so therefore f is going to be inversely proportional to root m, which is the same as m to the minus half. So the answer is A. Finally, we have a graph for resonance where we're now damping. So what happens? Amplitude goes down, maximum amplitude that is, peak goes to the left. Is it going to be B or D? Well, well, if you look at B, it's actually squashed a little bit that way. Here's our original shape like that, kind of. And then if we just take it down, then it ends up going like that, not like that there. So there we go, hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you want to see other Regu A papers, then click on the card and it'll take you to the playlist. See you next time.